you. Um, all right, hi everyone, welcome. Um, glad to have you back for today's seminar series. Today, again, we are adding to the, the list of very, very impressive speakers. Today we have Dr. Mark Abbott. Um, he was the 10th pres uh, president and director of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, and before that, he was the Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. Um, he's had quite a, quite a distinguished career. During, over the course of his career, he did hold a position jointly at both Scripps Institution of Oceanography and NASA JPL, both very prominent research laboratories. Um, and in 2006, he was appointed by the president to a six-year term on the National Science Board, where he overs oversaw the National Science Foundation and provided um, advice and guidance to the White House and Congress, which is very, very influential. Um, he has a number of distinguished recognitions, um, one of which is a member of the National Academies Ocean Studies Board. Um, and today he's gonna talk to us about technology and access to the sea. Um, so make sure you put your questions in the chat and I'll call on you um, at, at the right time. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thanks, Jen. Thanks everybody for, for coming and I will get this started. I'm assuming everybody can see everything. So it's an ocean revealed. So it's gonna be, obviously this is a class that's very interested in technology. So when we talk about climate change, oftentimes even scientists forget we're really talking ocean change. And in fact, the Paris Accord, I think the word ocean was barely mentioned, but uh, clearly now it's getting more and more prominence. This is just showing the global heat content uh, and its increase over the last 60 years. Uh, a lot of the heat that's being trapped by the atmosphere is going into the ocean. Uh, but we also know that there are other things that, you know, not just carbon dioxide. So we call this sometimes it's evil twin, which is we're lowering the pH of the ocean. Doesn't look like a lot there. You know, it is a logarithmic scale, as you know, but for a lot of marine creatures, pH is really important at particular stages of their life uh, in their ability to form a shell or what have you. So it's clearly something uh, that we worry about a lot with the ocean. Uh, many of you know we're seeing less and less sea ice. Uh, it wanders around from, this is just through 2019. Uh, some years it's gone up a little bit, but there's definitely uh, more open ocean in the Arctic, particularly in the, sort of the, the minimum extent of sea ice is usually in September. So in a couple of months, we'll see how we did in 2022. Uh, that is clearly influencing not only the Arctic Ocean and the associated ecosystems there, but it affects our weather, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere as the ocean is able to communicate with the atmosphere. And we're seeing less and less oxygen. Some of this is because as the ocean warms up, it becomes more stratified, i.e. warmer at the surface, less mixing and overturning and refreshing uh, the deep water with oxygen, but also uh, particularly you can see around coastlines as we add nutrients, we stimulate phytoplankton growth uh, they sink and decay and use up oxygen. And so we're seeing what areas that are normally low oxygen, like around the equator, expanding. And so we're seeing this change as well. But when isn't just the physics, chemistry, and biology that's changing, the way we interact with our ocean is changing globally as well. This is just a map uh, chart over the last 70 years of global marine uh, fish stocks, and you can see that more and more fish are in, fisheries are entering into the either collapsed or fully exploited side uh, as fishing fleets go farther and farther afield and exploit more and more species that it used to be those weren't the ones we were going after. So that, as you might imagine, is not only affecting those stocks, but at the ecosystem underneath that as well. And we're beginning to see uh, nations move from basically wild harvest to aquaculture. And we're beginning to see aquaculture production as a source of fish protein becoming almost as important as wild catch. Uh, right now, most of that is either right on shore, some is on land in pools, but we're starting to see some nations talk about open sea aquaculture because of trying to minimize environmental impact. 
And I should say that there are a lot of economic links to the ocean. Sometimes we forget this, that most goods and transport on the ocean, uh, certainly over the last couple of years during the pandemic, you've certainly seen a lot of disruptions in the shipping traffic, but uh, you can see that most of the areas that we transport, most of the goods and services go across the Atlantic, the Pacific, and around the Indian Ocean as well. So, and then sometimes you forget, those of us who are geeks understand that most of the world's data moves on seafloor cables. Uh, companies are expanding the numbers of those cables. Uh, what's interesting is that there are attempts to now start to be able to instrument those cables to use that to act uh, as an observing system. So the ocean plays an important role and it, in our activities and we're impacting its activities as well. So oceanographers have been working on ocean problems really starting in the sort of the early 20th centuries beyond the sort of initial uh, round the world cruises like the HMS Challenger from the United Kingdom. Uh, this is three script ships or Hui ships, sorry, from <laughs> my background there. The Atlantis there uh, in the upper left is actually was our first research vessel at Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, in, built in the early 1930s. It is still in service today in Argentina as a training ship. Atlantis II is over there. Was, that's a picture of it in the Black Sea. And then the present Atlantis is down there in the bottom. It's the mothership for Alvin which was just recently certified, did its deepest dive ever, uh, 6,400 meters. So 99% of the world's ocean is now accessible from Alvin and Atlantis uh, is its home base. But I should say oceanography has evolved a lot over the last century. This is on the first Atlantis. Uh, if you look at the, the folks on the left there, uh, you can count the number of safety violations. Uh, the most egregious of which is the gentleman with the cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> but uh, you could see that this was a sailing ship in the middle. It was rough teak decks and it was sort of uh, charming and uh, debonair and dashing the gentleman on the right, again, with the mandatory cigarette in the hand. But oceanography has always been hard. Uh, putting a mooring in the surface of the ocean and then having a weight at the bottom, five, 6,000 meters depth, means a lot of cable and wire. And having those moorings survive and be able to come back was a hard problem. Uh, this is showing a what was called technically a wuzzle when that retrieving that mooring created a huge mess. Uh, and even, so this is back in the 1960s, even moorings today on the right, sometimes things just don't work right and they come back and you have a real hard time. So the ocean is hard to observe. Uh, you get biology in the way when moorings come back, they're just overgrown with stuff. Uh, even underwater robots get wires tangled in their propellers and you get unexpected hazards. This is a underwater float that helps create buoyancy to hold up all those cables. It was crushed because an iceberg went over it, pushed it to a greater depth than its crushed depth, and down it went. So you get all sorts of interesting failure modes that you don't necessarily expect to see. Uh, you sometimes get living hazards. Uh, this is kind of a, a cute little video of an underwater robot, Remus, which is over there on the left. Uh, you can see that there's a tag on this particular great white shark. Uh, that's tracking its motions. It's uh, very curious about the uh, electromagnetic and me mechanical noises coming from this uh, particular underwater robot, just trying to decide, hmm, what do I want to do with this? I think I'll just kind of keep taking a look at it. You know, I don't really like it that it's in my territory. It's speeding up. It's slowing down. You know, I think I'll just kind of cruise in here. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really look very good. And then all of a sudden, there we go. And we this happens regularly, that we bring back these uh, Remus vehicles, and you can see big tooth marks on them. So uh, sort of an interesting episode. But I say that's kind of the interest, some of the interesting challenges, but the reality of understanding the global ocean, this 
fluid that really dominates. This is the ocean planet. What you see from space is the blueness of the ocean, where most of the heat, most of the carbon, most of our oxygen comes from the ocean. It plays an enormous role in our economic trade and moving data. We hardly observe it at all. This is just all of the world ocean moorings. There's not very many. It's hard and it's expensive. Probably the most successful global experiment are the what's known as the Argo profiling systems. These are like taking soundings in the atmosphere where you're taking vertical profiles of temperature and humidity with altitude. Uh, in the ocean, we're measuring temperature and conductivity as an indicator of salinity. Got roughly 4,000. This is from a few days ago, this global map. This is an international program. It's the equivalent of having two weather stations for an area the size of Nebraska. So those big black dots are actually little tiny profilers. So most of the world ocean is not measured. The other challenge is people are creating lots of different kinds of instrumentation. This is the United Kingdom's research vessel showing all the different kinds of underwater robots that they build and deploy. Lots of diversity. There are no standards for interacting taking a sensor pack from one robot and embedding it on another one. Everything is custom built. So we talk about this and you know we want to have these kind of telescopes in the ocean looking at what some people call the wicked problems, the ones that are global in nature that have lots of unexpected impacts, things that we, there's no easy solution, climate, sustainable fisheries, coastal resilience, the fact that the ocean is roughly three trillion in value uh, to our economy, and there's lots of uncertainty. So to do this, we need to have basically policies that we can learn and adapt and manage, which means you need observing systems that enable smarter models, more predictive and statistical models, so that we move to a world that's more knowledge driven rather than just curiosity driven creating some observations that create a scientific paper that's of interest to a group of scientists. Something where we really are sensing data, we're sharing it, we're integrating it, coordinating, and then do actions. We really want to move from a world where we sort of detect a problem and then go out and fix it to one where we can predict and prevent. And we're nowhere near there in the ocean environment. Some of you know that... Uh, Mark Andreessen used to say software is eating the world. Well, software and models are eating the world, certainly in the last 10 years with artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're looking at creating continuous learning, con collecting more data, better models, making better services. And to do that, we need data systems that are really end-to-end, -end, that it's easy to improve, that we open up all of the data sets that we have there and think about how do we organize to do that? Uh, if you look at oceanography today, at least in the United States and, and in Europe, Western Europe, it's really organized around a small number of ocean institutions, a relatively small number of oceanographers who are funded through competitive grants and contracts, largely from the National Science Foundation. Uh, their job is to do science and get promoted and get tenure and all that. That's good. But there's no real driver that brings that together to provide these community-based knowledge and services that we want, we all need to keep a healthy and sustainable ocean. So the challenge is, you know, how do we make decisions? And, you know, this is a little esoteric, but you're all going to be running into this. It's no different than what people tried to do during the pandemic. There's a lot of uncertainty. It's really complex and you're trying to manage risk. So we have different models of risk. You know, it's, they can either be realistic, precise, and general, or I can pick two out of those three. Can't get all three of them. And there are a lot of these complex, uncertain problems. You know, a climate model doesn't have to be really precise. We really want to have more adaptation as new problems emerge. 30 years ago, we didn't even think about ocean acidification and oceanography. That's a new problem. Uh, terrorism is another one. You want to be able to adapt and do iterative approach. So this is one where we're thinking of, it's not just computer networks, but it's intellectual networks, getting people to work together where things work, opportunities appear and risks appear rapidly and unexpectedly. And in some sense, your generation and younger folks, 
this is what a network interactive game is like. We want to create that kind of world where we're working together, understanding, I'm seeing this happen. Can I share my knowledge and information and understand and come to a greater understanding, working as a community, not just a patchwork of individual scientists? So how do we do that? This gets into the technical side. So you had a little bit of philosophy, changes on the ocean, how we address it today, where we need to go. We need to start thinking about making the ocean transparent. None of the technologies that really drive innovation were around when I was growing up as a young scientist. Oh, all of the focus was on specific science problems. So we really want to start asking questions like a software developer asks, what if the hardest problem was 10 times cheaper? What would change? How if we started acting more rapidly and more as a community? So the kind of ocean sensors that we as scientists have today, again, they're wonderful, but they're exquisite. They're handmade. There are a lot of ocean technology companies out there making equipment, but you know, they've in their lifetime, they've made a thousand devices or maybe a dozen. Uh, there's no consistent or development environment that's open where you can leverage an application programmer interface or hardware that I can build things together. It's very monolithic and very much a point solution. It's interesting talking to Huey engineers and scientists. They'll say that the seafloor is littered with what are called potting experiments. Now, potting is when you take maybe a little metal tube, you put a thermistor in it, and you surround it with epoxy so that the thermistor is in the water, but you've got this tight seal that keeps the water out of the electronics, the salt water, under pressure. And there are a lot of failed experiments because people didn't know how to do that because there's no community or standard to share that knowledge. So everybody kind of reinvents the wheel a lot. So we need to think about moving to what's called computational design, really thinking about 3D modeling, having more access to computer power, design with data. Really what we wanna to get to is go from bespoke, i.e. a custom made to scale. We don't need 4,000 Argo profilers, we need 400,000. We actually probably need 4 million to get at the ocean at the scale that we need to make those kinds of predictive models uh, that are necessary to have a healthy and sustainable ocean. Where we are is kind of like where the auto industry, parts of it still are there, but 10 years ago, if you opened up a car, the three heaviest parts are the engine, the chassis, and the wiring harness. You say, really? Well, the wiring harness is there on the left. It's your power windows, your climate control system, your seats, all its safety systems, all of those things that the auto manufacturers never had an architecture. So they just added it in. And so it becomes the most problem rich component of your car, a wire breaks or something doesn't work. It's heavy and it's expensive. If you go inside some of the electric vehicles now, like a Tesla, they're moving towards an automotive Ethernet-based system that starts to look like a hierarchy, easier to manage, easier to add in new services. Those of you who've seen, have friends or family who have Teslas know, sometimes it causes a little challenge, but you get software updates all the time, just like on your iPhone. It becomes a very different environment to work with. It's because it's an open platform and we need the underwater sensing world actually is messier than what's on the left, but it looks like that. So what we want to do, and this is from a, a slide from Fidela D, but MIT Media Lab, uh, we want an internet of things under the sea, smaller and more capable sensors, sensors that are embedded in like fiber optics, Lincoln Lab's been working on those kinds of things. We know that above the sea, we're expecting to see a trillion IoT devices in a few years. Can we do that under the ocean as well? 
Now it's a challenge because you don't have Wi-Fi or cellular networks and power is a real problem under the ocean. Communication doesn't work well underwater. So you have to think differently about creating those kinds of devices, but that's what we wanna to move towards. One of the advantages now though, is I can get intelligence out at the edge. It's not just a dumb robot that's collecting sensors. It can collect that data, model that data, analyze that data, understand its environment and begin to adapt. I don't necessarily have to communicate anymore because I can put intelligence out at that edge. And in fact, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, has been looking at oceans of things, of creating cheaper, low-cost floats using data analytics and cloud computing to really begin to get around this sampling problem. And so we could think about a vision of HUI that's not just ships, maybe it's autonomous aircraft that's deploying things using some of the CubeSats or microsats uh, to get data. We're gonna have 5G networks. I'm gonna have internet uh, everywhere over the world ocean and begin to get at that volume, that persistent pervasive sampling that I need to understand ocean physics, chemistry, and biology. So I used to work at NASA. I was involved in the Earth Observing System from NASA. This is what a satellite looks like. It used to look like this, a billion dollars, and it took 10 years. Bespoke, handmade, beautiful, but it took you 10 years and a lot of money and a lot of politics. But we're now in the last 10 years moved to smaller satellites. Uh, this is the Dove satellites from Planet Labs. They've launched hundreds of these now. They're on like their 14th generation imaging sensor because they can, it becomes more like a software development environment. They're a little more risky. They lose them all the time, but the fact of the matter is you just launch more. And we really wanna get at this kind of swarms under the sea. I don't think the world will ever look quite like this with fleets of torpedoes, but we might have a lot more pervasive sampling uh, than we do now. And in fact, at Woods Hole Oceanographic, uh, the leadership team there now is looking at an ocean vital signs network. They're starting in what's called the twilight zone. This is sort of between 400 meters or 200 meters and 1,000 meters where there's maybe a little bit of light, but there's not enough to create to support photosynthesis. Talking about different kinds of acoustic, acoustic sensors, tags on large fish, uh, cheaper floating devices to begin to instrument a volume of the ocean. I should also say, for those of you who are interested in data, it's not just the hardware. There are lots of data systems that are out there. I just put a few of them that are out there, private ones, international ones, government ones. Again, just like in the sensing world, the data systems tend to focus on support, supporting science. There's no easy way there's no market for somebody to come in and easily add data and plug in and leverage and find what you want. Uh, it looks like uh, your grandmother's attic. There's lots of cool stuff in there, but you're never quite sure. Why did grandma keep that? And why did she put it over here? So this is kind of beginning to wrap it up to think about the ocean is so important, but it's been largely the domain of government funded scientists and academics. The world needs the ocean. The world needs that access to the ocean. Commercial companies are trying to understand and make businesses about understanding the ocean, but it's still an area that if you don't have the secret sauce, <laughs> it's hard to make a bas basic ocean observing system. And it's really hard to make it in the volume that you need to really provide those predictive forecast models that somebody could, could actually make a business on. So we need a whole range of technologies, things that are built on hope, open hardware and software. Power is always a problem. Battery management is just, it's a tough problem. You know, physics and chemistry are not our friends when it comes to battery technology, even under the sea, but there are different kinds of flexible battery, approaches, there are different kinds of materials that are coming out there. The ability to put computing at the edge so that the message I need to send, because I've got fairly low bandwidth, 
can be a smarter message. It doesn't have to be a big volume. I have to send all the data. Maybe I just send the important signal that I've been able to drive on board that little underwater robot and send it out there. And thinking about where I am, a, a Huey engineer, Andy Bowen said, you know, the problem with every underwater robot is it doesn't know where it is and it doesn't know where its friends are. The two biggest problems, it can't navigate and it can't communicate. That's something that we're thinking about when I start to get a lot of them, maybe there are different ways to unpack that problem. But I'd say there are also some system capabilities. Getting things out to sea and back requires big expensive ships. The Atlantis, that's a $70,000 a day ship. That doesn't count the technical staff's costs. You're talking ships that cost, you know, $100,000, $150,000 a day to operate. Your tolerance for risk and failure are pretty low when it costs you that much to go there. No different than NASA. They launched billion dollar satellites, not because they were dumb, but because the rockets were just that big and they were that expensive. And he said, I got to fill it up. I got to make get all of my money's worth on that big rocket. SpaceX, other companies have totally transformed the launch market. That's what's changed the Earth remote sensing market. Thinking about data systems and being able to have things that I can leverage all the great ideas of technology that other people have have developed and get into a much more rapid innovation side. So really moving from a world where I can observe, predict, and understand where it's much more pervasive, different kinds of computer models, but deliver the knowledge and services to those who live and work with the ocean to leave, lead to much better stewardship than we have today. But I also say, even though I'm a geek, nothing beats seeing a sunset on the back of a ship. So with that, thank you for attention and I'm open to questions. Thanks, Mark, that was fantastic. Um, so we do have a, a whole bunch of questions and um, maybe we'll kick it off with um, talking a little bit about the data. Aishwarya, you, have, you had two questions that were sort of related. Maybe you could kick us off. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to ask how the data is processed so that the relevant conclusions are reached and like, if there are gaps in the data due to the lack of equipment to survey the entire ocean. So yeah, how is the data processed to reach those necessary conclusions? Yeah, okay, great, great question. Well, it, different ways. Obviously there are a lot of scientific programs where you know teams of researchers get out there, they, get, they write a grant proposal, they get funded, they go to sea, they collect their data and they come back and they analyze it. So that's the standard sort of field expedition. They collect, they build and deploy their own observing systems and analyze their own data. What I think you're asking for is the more public data like Argo or some of the moorings. A lot of that comes in through uh, government agencies like NOAA in particular. Uh, they will analyze, they, they will sort of clean up that data and then put it out and it's publicly available. Now, you as a scientist have to kind of go in and have all the tools to download the data and process it and all the rest. But that's all out there. There's not, you know, NOAA has its own sort of equivalent ocean forecasting, you know, like the National Weather Service collects a lot of data. Um, so that's you know, pretty straightforward. The trouble is that most, there just isn't enough of it. You know, I think the kinds of data that people want, uh, so for example, let's give harmful algal blooms is a, one of the big issues along the coast. These are, sometimes you may have heard them called red tides. West Florida has huge problem, but we get them in the Gulf of Maine off New England. Uh, trouble is, is when you get them, you got to shut down the shellfish uh, harvesting. And sometimes you have to close beaches. Hui has built, along with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, instrumentation that's really kind of like a DNA lab, a flow cytometry lab uh, in a can that they moor. There are two of them out there in the Gulf of Maine. So when we get the, the data that says there's bad things are coming, the state of Maine 
has no choice but to shut down the entire coastline because we don't know where it is. You know, it's just, it, we know it's out there, but we don't have the spatial resolution and we don't get the warning early enough to really make intelligent decisions. So it becomes a spatial problem, i.e. we don't, we can't see the small scales and a timeliness problem. So I don't know if that answers your question. Is that the getting there or there's follow-up that you want? Yeah, so just to follow up, do you think that uh, the problem right now is that the wrong type, or not the wrong type, but not enough types of data are being surveyed, like uh, like different aspects of the ocean are not being surveyed? Oh, or oh, is yeah. it that, that like there's not a sheer amount enough of data? Yes and yes. <laughs> it's very sparse. And even the data we collect tends to, if you look at those Argo profilers in that map, you know most of them are in the Northern Hemisphere because they're deployed on ships that are going around standard shipping lanes and there are very few ships that go to the Southern Ocean. If you look at the coastlines, they deploy out in the deep ocean. And so we don't survey the coastal areas very much. So we bias our samples and we don't sample anywhere near enough. That answers my Should question, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so maybe we can move on to David Bai. He had a couple of questions on international collaboration and data collection. David? Yeah, hi. Um, I guess these are more like logistical questions than like research-based ones, but the, the first one I, I wanted to ask are like, are there any like international research bodies? I know, I know the UN facilitates stuff and there's all of that, but are there like any international bodies focused specifically on like ocean research that could actually like oh. facilitate adoption of standards, because I think that's one thing you talked about, especially in vehicles. Yeah, yeah, that is, yes, there is, and they've been in place for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Scientific Committee for Ocean Research, uh, lots of data sharing agreements, but it's, you know, the UN now has the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. They just are having, they just had their kickoff meeting earlier this month in Portugal, got delayed a little bit because of COVID, finally had their in-person meeting. Dave, there are international agreements for sharing some ocean data like Argo data and mooring data, but there's just, the volume of it is still collect. The interesting stuff, as in the previous question, is the ecosystem data and the chemistry data that tends to be individual scientists. And there's, people put it in the NOAA databases and you have to share the data, but it it just kind of like, I just have to put my data in. There's no sort of easy way to integrate and locate that data. That's why there were all, I mentioned on that one slide, you know, like three or four people trying to create these data portals to bring all of that data set together. Um, yeah, there's standards out there, but you know, people say, I'm just trying to get my scientists, my science done. And so, there's standards. Do people always follow them? No. So there's a cultural issue there as well. Uh, I should say there's also, you know, some people say, well, what about all the navies of the world? You know, the U.S. Navy and the Chinese Navy and the Russian Navy, all have collected data. Some of it's proprietary, particularly some of the acoustic data, as you can imagine, with submarines and things. I don't think that's the bigger problem. The bigger problem is that there, the diversity of data is collected by scientists and it's not, it's not integrated into achieving sort of a, a larger mission. And that's something UN is trying to work on, but it's, it's hard. I mean, that's a great question. Okay. Um, just a quick follow up on the military topic, sort of. Um, as like vehicles, like underwater exploration vehicles become more mainstream and like commercial companies start to actually like maybe try and gather their own data. Do you think um, sort of the rules of like demilitarized zones or like how the ocean is basically split up for each country will change as like more vehicles and more people enter the water? Yeah, okay, great question. In fact, the Ocean Studies Board, we had that conversation last week. So maybe we need to get you on that. <laughs> it's a real it's an interesting thing because so for example if i want to collect data in territorial waters in the exclusive economic zone of a country i've got to go through the state department and get permission and i've got to share the data and all the rest doesn't mean the military isn't out there listing and things too but that's different i'm talking about the, the science side commercial data 
you know, I was actually talking to the NOAA administrator a month ago, and, you know, he wants to get more data from commercial companies. Uh, there are companies like Sail Drone and so far uh, that say, you know, we can collect the data for you, Noah, and do it a lot cheaper than you can collect it yourself. It opens up a whole can of it, it, interesting issues like who owns the data? Can you share the data? What about international agreements? Nobody has really addressed those yet. It's, I would just say, looking at the weather forecasting world, it used to be that the governments of the world collected all the meteorological data. They owned the satellites, they launched the satellites, they collect the data, everything. There were international agreements put in place to share that data so you had global forecasting models. You would have private companies like AccuWeather or Weather Channel that would take government data and do what we would call value add. They would add in their own kind of forecasts and, and all the rest, but they were still leveraging government data sets. That's changing. There are now privately owned satellite networks collecting atmospheric profiling data that they want to sell it to the government or sell directly to their customers like major airlines. They're creating their own models. Is this good, bad, or indifferent? Not clear, but it's different for sure. And nobody has really worked through intellectual property, national security, confidentiality, and openness and sharing because it is one ocean and it's one atmosphere. And so a lot of interesting experiments are being run. So th those are all great questions. All right, that helps, thank you. Great, um, let's move on to Logan who has um, a question about an undersea internet of things. Okay. Uh, yes, hi, I was, um, I was sort of wondering uh, what you, how you think the undersea internet of things will like change AUV research and research on climate change. Uh, you know, if I can, so there's a company called Teledyne Web. They make these gliders. They came out of Woods Hole Oceanographic. They're based on in Falmouth on Cape Cod. They've been in business for, they've been making these for roughly 10 years. They've, they've made a thousand. I mean, that that's that's not like my iPhone. I need a million of these things. When those when I start to get big numbers and that are out there all the time that can communicate and have intelligence at each node, as opposed to your normal, you know, if you look in your house, I mean, I only have 32 devices on my internet at home, right? You know, it's kind of scary, but I'm not even a uber geek on this kind of stuff, but you can think of people getting smart homes and IOT stuff because bandwidth and power are un effectively unlimited in a house life. Life is a lot easier in the IOT world on in the atmosphere than it is under sea. That's where I need to have the intelligence that's out there so that I'm sending smaller messages, which means less power, but smarter messages, more content per bit, because I've done some processing on board. You know, you can start thinking about you know, navigation right now in an underwater vehicle is all sorts of inertial navigation systems. And, you know, sometimes I have to go up and listen to GPS. If I have lots of them that can just send a few messages, I'm here, and maybe one out of 200 is actually got a GPS fix, and I can use some of the sound characteristics from each one of these, I begin to navigate in a different way when I've got lots of than just sparse. I don't think we've even scratched the surface to rethink how that problem would look like. If I have holographic cameras on all of these vehicles that can start to see things because I can, you know, maybe it's not great data, but I can get a lot of it. And I can use that to kind of beat down the errors. You know, that, that's that sort of image reconstruction becomes an interesting problem because I've got a lot of things. So, you know, I think IoT is going to be different undersea, but I think it's going to really make us rethink a lot of the ways we've done things over the last 30 years in the underwater systems. And in some sense, let me just finish up, the underwater robots that we make really look like Alvin without a person. I mean, that's really what they are. You know, now we, you know, if, if you start making things that are like a phone with that kind of intelligence and sensing inside that vehicle, that can talk a little bit. 
I think you can start really rethinking things and doing things differently. Great. Um, so maybe taking that one step further, um, Kai has a question about the balance between sensing and um, ocean life behavior. Uh, Kai? Okay. Oh, uh, yep. Hello. Um, so my question was just how, like, you had an image of a swarm of these, um, like, robotic um, undersea exploration vehicles. So how would that, you also had that video of the shark. So like, if we had, if we kind of flooded the ocean with these things, how would that affect them? Like if <laughs> animals are responding yeah. to them, like if they're comfortable with just metal tubes running around their territory, similar to the way like um, where I live in New Jersey, um, the deer, like they don't even bother you if you're like right next to them. So. Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. So I figure, you know, so I put up that slide with the swarms is just kind of a joke in some sense, because I think you're probably going to talk about very different form factors. And I think probably different sorts of propulsion and buoyancy systems, so they probably will be quieter. Um, you know, we basically built underwater to, you know, basically metal tubes with propellers on them is what, what they are now. But I, you know, there's interesting... Uh, John Debiri, I can't remember his name, he's out at Caltech, is really looking at sort of biomimetic type devices, things that actually move like organisms that are smaller. I think, you know, some of these things, it's pretty straightforward to make things cheaper, but I really want to be able to make them at scale, you know, i.e. a lot of them. You know, I want to be able to come up with an idea Friday, build it on Monday and deploy on Wednesday. Right now it's, I come up with an idea and then write a proposal and in two years, maybe I'll get funded and two years after that, I'll get it in the ocean. I think we're talking about uh, kinds of devices that, you know, they may be made out of materials that can dissolve, that there's less, I mean, nobody asks where do all those Argo profilers go when they die? They sink to the bottom of the sea. Okay, yeah, they, they, people have gone through the amount of waste and it's small and it's a big ocean, but at some point you want to think about getting things back. So either you're going to have things that are more, less, you know, they either fall apart and dissolve and create harmless substances, or you're going to want to be able to say they could pop up and I can go and collect them. So retrieval may become a very interesting problem to think about how do I get this stuff back? So I think you're really talking about different kinds of profilers and devices that may be a lot smaller, a lot less capable, and you can either get them back or they break down into something harmless. So in general, you think like it wouldn't, um, like as the industry evolves or like more people get into this, you know, the animal like well-being would be taking like more of a focus. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I don't, it's hard to say, you know, I, so far I haven't, haven't seen much of that impact. It's an interesting question. Don't know the answer to that. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, um, maybe now we can go to Vraj, who's very interested in how students can get involved. Um, so I was wondering how like, as students we can, either get involved or like learn more about these things. Because like mm -hmm. the internships or programs that we can do that, it's, it's, it's really hard to like find like resources to toward people like us about these fields. I feel like it's relatively underdeveloped compared to other scientific fields. So what would you recommend is how to get into this, these topics? Uh, <laughs> well, talk to Bob, you know, you're in the right program. <laughs> this is a great program to do. You know, this is something the oceans community in the US, I'll say again, just give that, and it's even around the world. It's a pretty small field. It tends to be at the graduate school level. You know, a lot of kids don't see it in their high school. I mean, kids aren't taught even earth science, let alone ocean science. And particularly if you're not there, um, you know, living right on the coast. You know, if you live near, if you are on the coast, you know, some, some of the major institutions like Scripps and Woods Hole have internship programs. Most of them are for college. Um, 
they're trying to expand the level of participation. So you you just have to go out and nose around and talk to to send email to people that are out there running on you know, their education programs. I think this program is good. I, you know, it, it's it's a great question and it's a great point. Everybody wants to say, how do I make the ocean more accessible? And education is a big part of it. Um, the Ocean Studies Board is part of the UN decade. We do have a youth, a youth component, which are kids that are sort of high school or freshmen, sophomores in college. They're younger. So you might go to the Ocean US Committee for the UN decade. Um, if you Google it, you might, after a few links, you'll probably find it, but we're trying to get more people like you and that generation involved in this. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. Again, another good, good question. And certainly there's nothing wrong with what you just said. I mean, it is hard. How do I get into ocean sciences? I'll say when I started graduate school, I had no intent to be an oceanographer. I was working at Lake Tahoe. And I had an advisor who was a refugee from high energy physics at Berkeley. And he was really interested in physics and biology. And I was getting my degree in ecology and happened to know math. I was also a Berkeley alum. So that put me in good stead with him. And I can remember him saying, you know, if you, the problems I wanted to study were better in oceanography. So I've only taken two oceanography courses in my life. And I was the director of HUI. So I should say my deputy director at HUI was had no oceanography courses. So sometimes people get into the field without oceanography degrees. They come in through engineering, they come in through any of the sciences. So I don't know if that answers your question. I don't have any great answers for that. It's a good question. Thank you. Okay, um, Amruta, do you wanna ask your question about uh, learning uh, from different fields? Yeah, um, so um, like undersea's exploration, is you know kind of I guess behind overseas exploration and uh, space exploration a little bit, right? So um, I guess since it's a little bit behind, you kind of see the problems that these other domains have encountered, and you can kind of learn from them, I guess. So um, I guess how do you kind of incorporate these problems and the lessons learned and make sure you don't um, make those same mistakes? Okay, you kind of broke up a little bit. So you're just looking at the space exploration and versus ocean exploration and what were the lessons learned in the space side? I want to make sure I answer the right question. Um, so basically, uh, there are different types of exploration that have been done, you know, in the past. Um, and then clearly, like, there are a lot of lessons learned from those okay. domains. So how do you apply that to your... Ah, yes. Okay. So I think... Great question. Uh, Ocean exploration was driven by scientific curiosity or national interest. You know, if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, the major powers of the world decided to have ocean exploration, be it the United Kingdom or Germany or France or what, what have you. you know, it was kind of a, a national prestige thing. Uh, at that point, Scripps, for example, Scripps Institution of Oceanography started in the early 20th century. But for a long time, most ocean sciences was very much coastal. It was driven a lot by marine biology. Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole was an outgrowth of Brown University or Harvard, actually. Now it's part of the University of Chicago. It was a lot of faculty who loved to study organisms who happened to live in the ocean because you could do some interesting biology there. That started to change in the 30s and 40s as the navies of the world saw that they needed to understand the ocean. And it really ex took off you know, af during and after World War II, at least particularly in this country and in Europe. Uh, other nations in South America and in Asia kind of came in maybe a decade or so later, but came in, uh, came in a, as well. So I think you know one of the lessons learned is that federal funding is really important to, to kickstart these things. Um, in the sort of 60s, 70s, there was another ex blossoming in this country when, you know, during the Cold War, when a lot of basically they added more ocean institutions. And I would say, you know, again, the lessons learned that federal funding can be used to expand the community of practitioners and the interest 
it then became you know important for understanding fisheries and weather. It, it moved out of the military realm. Um, I think in the 80s, what I would say, one of the lessons, and you see this in the space programs kind of off and on for a while, was international collaboration became really a value. You know, these programs are just too big for a single nation uh, that you needed that international collaboration. A lot of major programs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I think now where we are, and again, the space world is different too, which is what's the role of the private sector? I mean, you can look at SpaceX. I mean, let's just give one example. In the last year, there have been more rocket launches than there were in the previous 10 years combined. They were mostly commercial. They weren't NASA, they weren't NOAA, they weren't the military. So all of a sudden space was viewed as something of commercial interest. And I think that, I don't think we know the lessons learned yet, but it certainly transformed things. That's great. great so question. we have one last question and uh, I'm gonna ask Eloise. Yes, hello. Um, would HUI or other organizations consider doing an open data analysis hackathon in order to get ah. more students involved with analyzing the ocean? Yes, that's a, you know, they've done it at the, within the institution. They haven't done it focused yet on students, as I recall. I know uh, there's a woman at HUI who's had hackathons. They've been focused just on the scientists and the graduate students, but I think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, Hui just opened a new building about three months ago that's a little more sort of, it's more like the sort of the Beaver Works place. It's more of a garage shop collision space. I know they want to open it up to bring in those kinds of events, but that's a great idea. You know, I, I think one of the challenges has been just getting people on the campus for the last couple of years, you know, it's obviously been challenging. Now that's kind of gone, but even, you know, you can do it remote, but by being in person and interacting, I'm sorry, I'm old school. I still think it can't be beat, but it's a great idea. Thanks. Hey, 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 Mark, you want to uh, take that on? Maybe uh, this fall, maybe try to come up with a <laughs> open uh, hackathon. Yeah, I'll bring it up to the people who get paid to do that. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Yeah, it's a great idea. Great, thanks. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to um, ask two of our CubeSat students, Fiona and Tony, to um, please uh, unmute and thank our speaker. Oh, yeah, Hi, sure. oh, you can go first. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for giving this talk. I really enjoyed listening to all the oceanographic research that who he does, and especially your back, your background in like NASA and working on satellites. I thought it was really interesting to see that connection between satellites and oceanographic research. And overall, yeah, thank you so much for giving this awesome insight um, to us students here today. Um, so thank you for coming and talking to us today. It was really interesting to learn about how ocean changes are studied and dealt with and how many different challenges can arise. Um, and we also, if you haven't received it already, we have. Oh yeah, the it's in the wash right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much. This was a wonderful talk and a great discussion and question and answer session yeah. after. Great questions. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks, thank Bob, you. for inviting me. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.